Thank you so much for joining us. You're watching Beyond Markets. Welcome, I'm Esther Awuni. On today's show, we'll discuss how Africa's most populous country, Nigeria, can move the needle for the development of its healthcare systems. As always, you can join the conversation with the hashtag Beyond Markets, and you can send tweets to my Twitter handle too for your comments. It's at Esther O. Awuni. Now, Nigeria plans to spend about 4.1% of the 2019 budget on healthcare, a far cry from the 15% agreed to by African heads of state in the Abuja Declaration of 2001. Ifayan Sofo, director at Nigeria Health Watch, joins me to discuss how Nigeria can move the needle for the development of its healthcare systems. Ifayan, thank you so much for taking the time out to join us this morning. Now, obviously, Nigeria has not been allocating 15% of its annual budget to uh, healthcare. But what we did see uh, last year was the spearheaded by the Senate then, uh, was the allocation of 1% of the consolidated revenue fund uh, into the basic uh, health care provision fund, the BHCPF. Uh, I'm not sure if that's something that's going to be continued uh, on a yearly basis, but what are your thoughts in terms of how Nigeria has not been able to allocate uh, this 15% uh, that was agreed to in 2001 and what it has done to perhaps by way of augmentation? Okay, so thank you, Esther. Thank you for having me again. I think, I think first of all, um, when the Abuja declaration was made, you know, that some time ago, since then, lots of development have, you know, have happened within the health sector in terms of financing. And for Nigeria, I think 2018 probably will stand as the year that the federal government, you know, demonstrated the highest political will for health care, for health financing in the country. And I say this because the National Strategic Health Development Plan was approved and budgeted for about 6 trillion naira. Uh, the Basic Health Care Provision Fund was approved for the first time, 55 billion for 2018, and again budgeted for 2019, uh, 51 billion. And I think what lots of people don't know is that about 23 states across Nigeria have signed their own state health insurance laws and are at different stages of implementing. So these are different ways that financing is coming into the health, health sector as compared to before. Um, so having itemized these different sources of funds, it's also good to say that um, the 2018 Basic Healthcare Provision Fund, although has been approved, but the funds have not been released because it was just launched uh, uh, last Wednesday here you know, uh, in Abuja at the State House with different stakeholders present. Uh, so there are different sources of funding entering into the space. And I'm also aware that you know, some investors are also investing in you know, private hospitals across, uh, across the country. But um, having said that, 4.1% as, as a percentage of our total budget is, not, is also not enough as you know, government uh, commitment to, to, the, to funding the health space. Now, for this basic health care provision fund, now, usually I've, I've heard so many uh, health care experts tell me that, you know, for us to have an effective health care system in the country, if we can get our basic health care at a basic level as a primary health care now, if we can get that right, because that's where we have majority of people, you know, I mean, the, in, in the grassroots areas, uh, the, the clinic down the road uh, in the community, that is usually the go to the first point of call. If we can get it right at that level, then we are on the path to solving and having a stronger healthcare system. So is this fund going to start at that level? Yes, it's, it's going to operate at the primary healthcare level. And I think what people have been saying based on your, 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 your statement is, is actually based on the evidence from the World Health Organization that 80 to 90 percent of the healthcare needs of an individual can be provided for at the primary healthcare level you know, at the, you know, during the person's lifetime. So that the bedrock of care is at the primary health care level. Over the years, of course, uh, that particular sector has been has not been has not received the you know the attention that it requires. And this is not unrelated to the fact that over the years, local government councils have not really functioned across the country because it's under the purview of local government councils to provide health care. Yeah, so the basic health care provision fund is supposed to fund primary health care centers across the country. Uh, and I think that. One innovative thing that Professor Isaac Adewole and his team have done in terms of the guidelines for the expenditure of the uh, Basic Healthcare Provision Fund is that for the first time, the fund will go directly to participating primary health centers. So it will not go through any state or any federal agency that is going to you know, keep it and bureaucracy will come in. The fund is, is going to be domiciled in this, at the CBN and there are guidelines for primary health centers that are participating, you know, that will benefit from it 
to receive funds directly to the, health, the primary health center in charge and another um, person within the ward where that primary health center is allocated. So absolutely, if we don't get primary health care center right, uh, health care delivery right, you know, I mean, we'll still be battling with all sorts of issues we have in Nigeria. Okay, so we have, I mean, we're lucky to have gotten funding now, even though it hasn't been disbursed. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you uh, in terms of how this is going to be disbursed, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, also, and I know that it's not just funding, you know, that's bedeviling the sector. I've also, you know, heard that uh, healthcare or health information systems, sometimes we do not have uh, the right data in terms of uh, those who are in need of services, how many, perhaps how many clinics we have, especially uh, in the rural areas. What are we doing, or perhaps by way of policy, to strengthen our health information system so we have the right kind of data? Okay, I mean, I, I think I think this is where this is where you know uh, technology you know uh, uh, comes in, uh, and I know at the federal level there are different health uh, health management information systems that the that the federal government, you know, has, um, has, uh, has been working with, you know, over the years. But, you know, uh, when we talk about healthcare in Nigeria, you know, most of the time we really focus on the federal government and its agencies of health. However, states, most of the states are really, you know, lagging behind, you know, local government councils and all. So that no matter how well the federal government is doing through the Federal Ministry of Health, states on their own should begin to invest in some of these basic technologies. You know, so for example, sometime last year we did an evaluation of the integrated disease surveillance and response system with focus on tuberculosis, uh, and we found out that one of the basic challenges is that community monitors who report cases of TB to the, the disease surveillance and notification officers in local government councils do not even have either mobile phones or they don't have, if they have mobile phones, they don't have networks, you know, they don't have data to send information through WhatsApp or through, you know, SMS to the disease surveillance and education officer at the local government council. So we have to make use of technology here, and the very simple, basic technology that can help somebody that is running a primary health care center at the front lines to be able to send information about cases seen, challenges they are having, and refer cases to the next level of care. Okay, let's quickly talk now about the National Health Act. And uh, I've heard uh, health practitioners say that uh, the act has mostly been uh, implemented with the exception of the, uh, the basic health care provision fund. Now, what are your thoughts in terms of how this act has been able to adequately address our health issues as a country in terms of the system that we run and what those gaps are and how we can, you know, make them work for the, the entire population? Okay, so I think, to be honest, the, the basic health care, the National Health Act has not really been, been implemented I think it's even the financing aspect, the basic health care provision fund that has gotten, you know, some kind of attention from, you know, from, from the public as well as, you know, practitioners in the space. You know, I, I, let me give you an example. One of the, one of the you know, uh, sections in the, business, in the National Health Act actually stipulates that, you know, uh, health facilities operational in the country have to be pre-qualified and given proper license and proper standing to provide quality health care to people. That has not been done. They should be pre-qualified and given, you know, like a certificate of good standing. That has not been done. The same National Health Act also stipulates that if you have an emergency case, it is against the law for a health care provider to deny the person treatment because of inability to pay. You know, you, of course, you, you have, of course, every day you hear about people, you know, being denied care at different, um, at different levels. So, so ju just to state that the National Health Act has not really been implemented the way it ought to be implemented. But if we look at the Basic Health Care Provision Fund, I think the good thing about it is that, one, it's been budgeted for 2018, uh, it's been approved for 2018, but also budgeted in 2019, and there are different aspects of the fund. So ideally, 50% of that fund is supposed to go you know, to health insurance through the NHIS, not to them, but through them. 45% of that money should go to the National Primary Health Care Development Agency through then to those primary health centers that I spoke about. And 5% go to emergency care. And I think one thing that Professor Adewole and his team have done is that they've agreed to split the 5% for emergency care into two. 2.5% 2 will go for hospital treatment, people who have accidents on some major highways, so that when they get to health facilities, such funds will be, draw to be drawn from such funds to fund them. 
But most importantly for us at Nigeria Health Watch, the other 2.5% is going to the public health agency, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, so that the country can prepare very well for, you know, epidemics and disease outbreaks. You know, so that these are the different things I think that uh, the, this present administration has done well, but we are watching them closely to say, when are you going to release that money and, and you know, so that the CSOs can actually follow the money and ensure that it is uh, spent the way, the way it's been planned. So in your opinion, would you say that this will be enough to move the needle in terms of how we begin to fix our healthcare system? Okay, I mean, uh, it won't be enough to move the needle, but at least it's a good start because this is the first time that the federal government of Nigeria will be demonstrating the political will required to kickstart universal health coverage. Universal health coverage is not a destination, it's a journey. So it's a good, it's a good beginning with the, with the approval and hopefully release of the Busy Healthcare Provision Fund. And the good thing again is that this fund is going to be channeled directly to health facilities that will be part of you know, part of uh, its implementation. And the National Health Act also stipulates that states and LGAs that are participating in this should provide 25%, you know, uh, counterpart funding. And the federal government has kind of made it easy for state and local government to say, okay, we don't want you to, to, you know, put that money into kind of basket funding with us. What we want you to do, we have a standard, you know, um, that the health facilities must be up to before we invest. So the health facilities in your domain, in your state, bring those health facilities to that standard that we expect, then we can now invest so that people can benefit from uh, healthcare at the point of uh, need without having to pay for it at that point. What about the private sector? Is there a role that the private sector can play here? No, yeah, absolutely, because some of the participating health facilities will be private sector health facilities. Um, but, you know, um, having said that, we know that over the years, uh, unfortunately, the federal government, donors, you know, international partners working in Nigeria have not really done so much to involve, you know, the private health sector space in Nigeria. But this 2019, that is beginning to change. Some of them will participate in the Basic Healthcare Provision Fund implementation. Uh, and I'm aware that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, you know, and uh, uh, MSD for Mothers, Mark for Mothers, are also planning to... Uh, train patent medicine vendors, you know, that would, you know, provide some kind of services in some of these facility, uh, communities without um, uh, functional health facilities to provide some level of maternal care, but most importantly, family planning commodities to people uh, who, who, who need them. Okay, Dr. Fine, we'll take a quick break now. We'll come back and pick up from where we left off. Thank you for your time so far. I've been speaking to Fine Sofor, director at Nigeria Health Watch, taking a look at Nigeria's healthcare system and how we can move the needle uh, and just improve the entire uh, system as it were. If you're just joining us, Ifai Sofor, director at Nigeria Health Watch, is with me today and we're discussing ways to improve the healthcare system here in Nigeria. Let's pick up from where we left off now. Obviously, uh, the statistics are out there, the percentage, percentage of Nigerians that have insurance cover is still very low. I mean, we do have HMOs in the country, but that hasn't been a smooth ride in terms of getting that system to work and getting more Nigerians you know, into the insurance cover bracket. But in your opinion, just briefly tell us your perspective, where we may have gone wrong with that and what you see being done now to improve that system. Okay, I think when it comes to health insurance in Nigeria, the first mistake that we made, you know, this is like 13 years of the National Health Insurance Scheme being in operation. The first mistake was that health insurance is not mandatory as a nation. You know, so that was the first mistake. mistake. So what it meant that, you know, even employers were at liberty whether to provide health insurance for their people or not. And this was why in, three years ago, the higher decision-making body in healthcare you know, in Nigeria, the National Council on Health gave approval to states to begin to sign their own health insurance laws, which are mandatory. And at, as at the last count, 23 states have signed health insurance laws, and I, I, there are different stages of implementation. And of course, if you look at the leadership of the Nigeria Health Insurance Scheme, I mean, all sorts of things have been happening there over the years that um, they've not got it right, you know, to the extent that just about 1% of Nigerians have health insurance. But this health, state health insurance laws, as they are being signed and implementation is beginning at different stages in different states, will help us, you know, kind of improve the pool of people with health insurance because those health, state health insurance schemes are mandatory. 
And I also know that the Senate Committee on Health, said by the, the, chaired by Senator Tejo Osho, they are also working to uh, review the National the NHIS Act to make it mandatory. So that, you know, at the federal level as well as the state level, health insurance becomes mandatory. And hopefully, we can increase the pool of Nigerians with health insurance. So obviously, the issue of affordability comes into play here. Some Nigerians may be asking, mm -hmm. especially perhaps in the rural areas, would I be able to afford insurance? Uh, and what, uh, what will my insurance cover? Would it cover existing conditions, uh, and, you know, et cetera? What are your thoughts on that? Okay, I think first of all, it's important for, 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 for the viewers to understand the concept of health insurance. It's a risk pooling. The larger the pool of people, the cheaper for the people that subscribe to the scheme and the lower the risk because the risk is, is you know, spread thinly across the large pool. The problem with Nigeria is that we have a very small pool of people with health insurance and that is why premiums are very expensive. But then, different HMOs have actually brought down, I know a health insurance, uh, HMO plans that are like, you know, 15,000, 20,000, 25,000 for a year. I know that poverty is high in Nigeria, but I think that at least 50% of Nigerians can afford to buy some of these very cheap health insurance. Because when they buy it, the pool increases, money is available for HMOs to do the work, and that kind of builds confidence in the system for more people to invest in it. Um... I think to a large extent, it, it, it actually comes down to willingness to pay. What are you ready to give up in order to buy health insurance? Some people spend much more than, you know, some of these health insurance plans on some things they could have actually, you know, have um, set aside for the meantime to get health insurance for themselves. And that's why for us at Nigeria Health Watch, in as much as we try to hold government accountable for some of those things, but we're also saying that it is time for Nigerians to make health a priority we don't as a people and because of that we don't really you know we kind of wait for government or on the other hand we wait for god you know to give us the good health that we desire you know so nigerians must begin to prioritize their health you know for this particular election year in nigeria health world you started a campaign hashtag vote for health niger when people come to campaign you know to you you need to ask questions about what are the plans to provide affordable health insurance equitable of high quality to you as a people before you decide who it is you're going to vote for. We have to prioritize health as a people, as Nigerians. Now, if there's one thing that also continues to hold back the healthcare system in Nigeria is the back is what we see that plays out between the federal government and you know workers in the in the health space. I'm talking about the incessant strike, uh, industrial actions that we see from time to time. We hear stories of unpaid wages, of poor remuneration, and this is something that I see happening almost every year. And it doesn't look like there may be an end in sight. What are your thoughts in terms of how? we can address this as an issue on its own. I mean, obviously, there are issues around uh, you know, providing healthcare itself and getting the right equipment and building more hospitals and clinics. But for the practitioners themselves, when they decide to down tools, then I just feel like it takes us back to square one. So what are your thoughts in terms of how, either through the Ministry of Health, the Minister of Health, and up to the federal government, what they are doing or what's being done now, conversations that are being held to ensure that this does not continue? Okay, first of all, for us at Nigeria Health Watch, we're against you know, any form of strike. We think that um, there has to be some level of negotiation because ultimately when strikes happen, people die. People have all sorts of lifelong complications because of strikes. I think that the major problem when it comes to strike is that the health sector is not well funded and um, health workers as a result are not really held accountable. Because in as much as we want to hold health workers accountable for the quality of care they are delivering, but the health worker is either not paid adequately or doesn't have some of the basic equipment to provide the care that they're supposed to provide for people. And through our platform, Nigeria Health Watch, our blog, we have written about the strike, you know, and what we think ought to be done, you know, over the years. We think that, first of all, that the government needs to invest properly in, 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 in healthcare delivery. Provide a good working environment for the health workers. You know, improve their remuneration so that you cannot begin to hold health workers accountable, let people be paid, doctors, for example, should be paid based on how much that they work. But what you see happening now is that because of the confusion in the system, doctors in government hospitals spend one or two hours there and go to their private practice. And as, uh, at the same time, they expect to be paid for, for, for being free government workers. So government needs to invest in the system very well, improve remuneration, provide you know, training for health workers, provide equipment and all sorts of commodities then will not, they will not set 
you know, some kind of accountability mechanism so that people are paid according to how much that they work. You know, so it, it's something, it's a discussion that, you know, uh, is ongoing. But ultimately, strikes really should never happen. Because think about it, two years ago when it happened in the UK, uh, I mean, emergency services were not affected, you know, because they knew that people would still be sick, people would come with all sorts, of, all sorts of issues. But here, once it happens, everybody downs to and everybody goes away, you know. So once we have the right investment and people are held accountable for what they are supposed to do with all the punitive measures in place, uh, we think that the, sec the that that you know the industrial action within the health sector would would reduce. I know we know that this has caused a lot of damage over the years, and one one major damage, you know, one major fallout of this uh, incessant strike action and the back and forth between the government and, and the doctors themselves is a brain drain that we've seen in the system. So many doctors we know and we've heard, we continue to see in the news, uh, have left Nigeria, have gone abroad for you know to get better, and you know they many of them as we hear, you know, get a better deal as it were, and this continues to happen. What are your thoughts in terms of how the government can help stem the strength and what can be done, perhaps uh, bringing all stakeholders together to ensure that we do not lose our very best because of the problems he uh, here at home? Okay, you know, interestingly, last year we did, a, we did a poll with doctors, some in Nigeria, some already, already after the country. We did that poll uh, in partnership with NOI polls to find out from doctors why they immigrate out of Nigeria. And we found out that 88% of the peep doctors we interviewed are either already out of the country or in the process of living. And they gave different reasons why they are living. You know, the pay is poor. And, you know, they are taxed heavily as a result. They don't have equipment to work. There is poor relationship even between junior and senior doctors. Uh, they don't have training opportunities. All sorts of things that we think are uh, things that ideally, you know, there, there, are, there are problems that, you know, that we know what the solutions, you know, are there for. Um, but you see what happens is that it's almost as if government is even in denial, you know. Uh, when you bring it up with, with the government, people tell you, no, that it's not up to that number. But I know I'm a doctor. I have friends. I have colleagues. I'm within the space. We've done a research. People are living and they're giving these basic reasons as why they are living. They are not paid very well. You know, they don't have good conditions of service. You know, they don't have equipment to work. They don't have training opportunities. Some 20, 30 years ago, if you were doing your residency in Nigeria as a doctor, when you get to a senior resident, you had opportunities to travel abroad, mainly the UK, to get some kind of specialist training before you come back, you know, and complete and become a consultant. These opportunities are no longer there. And by the time you see that, like when we did that particular research with NOI polls, we found out that one of the reasons is also because, you know, doctors graduate, half of them go travel abroad, they are, they are in contact with their colleagues who are still in Nigeria. They are telling them, you know, how good it is over there. And before you know it, you know, somebody says, well, I can't take this any longer. And, you know, goes ahead to write the exams and, and the person leaves. But the solutions are very basic. It just has to, you know, do with providing doctors with the right, you know, conditions of service. Pay them well, commensurately at least with some of the African countries, to be honest. They're not even asking for much. And provide training opportunities, you know, for them. Do you see any signs that this can happen soon? And I know that this obviously will be spearheaded by the Ministry of uh, Health. Do you see this happening anytime soon? Are we, have, are we hearing conversations of that already? To be honest, we're not hearing any conversations like that. Um, but I think the state must take responsibility here. Years ago, when I, worked, when, when I was implementing projects across communities, I, I went to different states that they even got, you know, they, were, got, they got Egyptian, Egyptian doctors. They were paying them much more than, you know, the Nigerian doctors that were here that understood the sector. So when you go to different states, they actually get, you know, expert rates and pay them higher than Nigerian doctors are being paid locally. You know, so Nigeria is a federation. There is so much that the federal government can do in terms of this. States on their own must begin to, you know, make their own states competitive for doctors. I mean, when, if a doctor is asking, if a fresh graduate of a, a doctor is asking for, say, 300000 as salary, you know, and the doctor can get 400000 in Sudan or, or get it in, um, in Kenya, uh, the chances that the person is going to leave, we're not even talking about going to the UK or the US. Nigerian doctors are all over Africa now, working in all sorts of places. State governments must begin to realize that they can't, we can't keep happening on the federal government. They should also begin to make their state competitive. If they can pay foreign doctors to come and work in Nigeria, 
they can afford to pay Nigerian doctors to work there as well. Thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. I've been speaking to Dr. Ifan Sofo, Director at Nigeria Health Watch, and we've been discussing uh, how we can move the needle in making Nigeria's healthcare system a much better one. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Remember, you can watch all previous episodes of the show on our website, cnbcafrica.com, and you can stay engaged with the hashtag Beyond Markets. For myself and the rest of the team, it's bye for now.